So that that's how furnaces are rated. Let's talk about air conditioning a little bit. A ton of cooling. You're going to hear this all the time. Oh, I want a three-ton unit. I want a five-ton unit. Oh, I need a ton and a half unit. Oh, what the heck is a ton of air conditioning? That's a measurement of weight. Well, it is a measurement of weight. And what we're talking about is a block of ice that's 2,000 pounds, that weighs 2,000 pounds. That is a ton of ice. And the amount of time it takes to melt all that ice to water. A ton of air conditioning is the amount of heat necessary to melt one ton of ice, 2,000 pounds of ice, in 24 hours. How much heat do you have to supply to that, two, uh, that ton block of ice to get it to melt in a 24-hour period? Well, here's the answer. 144 BTUs per pound. That's called the latent heat of condensation. Every pound of ice that you melt at 32 degrees that becomes water at 32 degrees requires 144 BTUs per pound be added to it to cause it to melt, to condense. So if we have 144 BTUs per pound and we have 2,000 pounds, a ton of air conditioning, and a lot of people in your office may not even know that, is 288,000 288, BTUs per day. Now, there's 24 hours in a day, so divide that 288 by 24, and you're going to get 12,000 BTUs per hour. That's typically the way it's stated in our industry, and it's a nominal value. That means that a three-ton air conditioning isn't necessarily three times 12,000 or 36,000 BTUs. It could be anywhere from 33 to 37,000 BTUs, depending on which condenser and coil combination you use. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But this is a nominal value. Now, there was a place, and I can't think of where it is. I think it was in St. Louis. There was a eh, St. Louis or Cleveland. I, I don't remember. I'm, I'm all over the country all the time. But uh, there was a park in this fairly large city. And it was located somewhere in the center of town. And this radio station ran a promo every year and trying to raise money for charity. And what they would do, they'd take a 2,000-pound block of ice, you know, from a local ice company. They'd put it in the center of the park and in a little pan, you know, not a little large pan that was built up around it so they could hold all the water. And they would charge you, I think it was 10 bucks or 20 bucks a pop, to make a guess as to what time of day and day of the month or week it would melt that the last solid piece of ice would go to water. They raised a fortune. They did it every year. It was a real popular event. They raised a lot of money for charity. And, of course, all the engineers came out with their slide rules and their calculators, and all the meteorologists were out there with their hygrometers and sextants, and, you know, everybody's trying to predict temperature coming up ahead and how long it's going to take and, you know, the latent heat of condensation is a big issue with the engineering people, of course. And the person that wins every year, of course, is some grandmother that picks her grandson's birthday, you know. So it's a cute thing, but that's literally what a ton of air conditioning is. 2,000 pounds of ice melted in a 24-hour period generates 12,000 BTUs per hour is required to do that. You'll see this. 400 CFM per ton, too, another nominal value that doesn't hold up everywhere. If you're listening to this and you're in Tucson, Arizona, you need a lot more than 400 CFM per ton because you don't have moisture in your air and you're at elevation. So you need to supply more air for the same amount of heating or cooling. If you're in a damp area, that's probably a good number, but you could even go lower. Anywhere from 350 to 415, 420 are, are very common, 450. What's CFM? CFM is a volume measurement. It's cubic feet per minute. That's what CFM stands for. A cubic foot of air, plain air, the air sitting right in front of you. Take a 12-inch by 12-inch by 12-inch block of it. That's one cubic foot. If you were to put that cubic foot of air on a scale at sea level, it would weigh 0 0.0741 pounds. You know air is pretty light stuff. Whether you're at sea level or you're up in the mountains, it's light. 
If you take 13.33 of those cubic feet, you're going to have one pound. What's one pound of air? One pound of air is, what? what's 13.33 cubic feet? It's, uh, take a phone booth, if you're old enough to remember what a phone booth was. They don't have too many of them anymore, but it used to be a, a booth you would go into. It was roughly two feet square and about six and a half, seven feet high. So it held about two pounds of air. So half of the air in a phone booth. And that's without Superman in there changing his clothes because he takes up a lot of room. And we get to another value. The reason I'm working up to this is this, 0.244 BTUs. That's the specific heat of air. The specific heat of air is the amount of heat necessary to raise the temperature of one pound of a substance, air, one degree Fahrenheit, when the air is 70 degrees. Now, so what's one pound of air? Th half a phone booth, 13.33 cubic feet. So if I take a wooden match, do it this way. I take two wooden matches, go into a phone booth where there's two cubic feet of air. When the air in that phone booth is 70 degrees, I can raise the temperature to 71. Some relevance. Nominal volume ratings for air handlers and blowers work this way. Because CFM, cubic feet per minute, is what we're circulating. It's all this stuff we're circulating. We circulate 13.33 CFM, we're circulating a pound of air. Now think of it this way. There's 400 CFM per ton nominally. Before, if I have a three ton unit, I have what? 1200 CFM I need to circulate to get that 36,000 BTUs into the building because of the specific heat and the weight of the air and all that. But do the math. 1200 CFM, 1200 times 0 0.0741. You know, uh, that's what? About 90 pounds. How about if you have a four ton unit? Four times 400. Now you need 16. 100 CFM of air, 1,600 times 0 0.0741, that's about 120 pounds. My wife weighs 120 pounds. She's 5'7", 120 pounds. I'm circulating the weight of her body every minute CFM through a duct system we designed in order to get the cooling we need. It's a tough job we got when we have to design all this stuff and lay it out and size it and pick blowers and it's not easy. Nominal volume ratings for air handlers go like this. There there's about seven sizes. One and a half, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, and five. It's about half ton increments, but not everywhere. We jump from four to five. Okay, there's no four and a half ton unit. Um, I say that and I know there's an exception to the rule certainly, but Nine out of nine times, you're not going to find a four and a half ton unit available. Residential work, this is it. This is the beginning of it. Some manufacturers make a one ton unit. It only goes to five ton. After five ton, you're in what we call light commercial work. The next step from five ton typically is seven and a half ton. So it's a big leap. Problem is, seven and a half ton blower is a big commercial ugly looking unit that you're not going to put in the residence right and it's going to make too much noise anyway it's not designed for that so this is what this 400 cfm stuff is about when you hear cfm just think okay they're circulating air that's uh, so many cubic feet of it per minute and of course the three ton unit is going to have 36,000 BTUs and 1200 cfm you you know every, every ton of air, every 12,000 BTUs needs at least 400 CFM to get it to where it's going. Cooling. Let's build a cooling system. In every cooling system, every typical cooling system, there's a million ways to cool people. You can cool people by blowing water on them. Uh, you know, it's called evaporative cooling. Ever been to a football game, preseason game in the summertime? And on the sidelines, you see the players sit in front of these fans, and the fans have water. The fan is turning, big, big propeller fan is turning, and they're spraying water in front of the fan, and that water is blowing on the players. Because as that water evaporates, you got the wind chill effect working again, it makes them feel cooler, and it helps 
take the heat out of their body because anything that boils, vaporizes, takes heat away with it as it does it. All right? So we got this compressor. We're going to build a refrigeration system. We're going to take the refrigerant out of this compressor, and it's a compressor. What it does is compress refrigerant. It makes it very hot. The refrigerant actually comes, starts out in its path very hot. And we're going to have a coil, a big condenser coil. And what this is is just a serpentine coil. It, it enters here and goes all the way around and comes down here. These are return bends and starts all the way back. And it, it does this over and over again, over again for the size of the coil. How big is this coil? How big is the system? Because it's got to match this compressor's capacity. So that's the condenser coil. Then we're going to add a condenser fan. We're going to put that on the top of this particular one. And it can be on the side, it can be a draw through, a blow through, it doesn't matter. But basically with this design, what we're going to do is pull air in from the outside, 95 degree air in from the outside, over this coil, and we're going to discharge the air straight up in this particular case. Now we could do the opposite. We could blow the air down in here and push it through the sides of the coil. But that's not as efficient as pulling it through and blowing it up in this particular design. Just suffice it to say the fan is going to take this heat. Now this, this line coming out of the compressor on a hot summer day could be close to 200 degrees. It, it very often is 180 or above. Okay, Very hot. And what's going to happen here in the condenser, we're going to take this hot gas. This fan is going to blow 95 degree air over 200 degree gas. And guess what? It's going to cause that gas to condense because it's going to take heat away. 95 degree air can take a lot of heat off of a 200 degree refrigerant and it's going to cause the refrigerant in there to condense and then hence the name condenser. That's the condenser coil. When we're all done this whole thing is called a condensing unit and a lot of people get messed up with that. Oh I need a new compressor. Okay you show up in a job and this thing has been a tree hit this thing and the whole thing is destroyed, the whole condensing in it. And you say to the guy, I thought you wanted a new compressor. I said, no, I, I need, yeah, I need a new compressor. It's not a compressor, it's a condensing unit. The, a part, a major part of the condensing unit, the whole system, is a compressor. Now, we're going to take this, which is now is a hot liquid, and we're going to take this hot liquid out here. It started out as a gas. We took heat off of it, it condensed to a vapor. Think of it in terms the refrigerant in here, which is a wonderful product. Think of it as a uh, as steam. This was a little steam boiler that compressed steam and sent it out into this coil, and we blew air over the steam, and what happened? It condensed back to water again. But it's still hot water because it was just hot steam a minute ago. So now we're going to take this hot fluid, we're going to run it up what they call a liquid line, and we're at some point we're going to get to this thing inside because this whole thing is outside we're going to get to this thing inside which in this case I'm showing you what we call an A-coil evaporator an evaporator that sits on top of some kind of an air handler either a blower you know a furnace that could sit right on top of the furnace the heat exchanger would be down here the blower would be here and we'll use the furnace blower to blow air over this coil because when this hot liquid enters this coil there is an expansion device and this is a serpentine coil too you see all the return bend and passes here just like this except it's not one pass it's layered there's about four passes in each side and it starts out here and it goes back and forth and back and forth and it ends up here it goes back and forth and back and forth and then out the other way so as the hot liquid refrigerant comes in here it expands and when it expands its pressure changes and it becomes cool that's one of the tricks if you will one of the mysteries <laughs> of refriger refrigerant the refrigerant if it's R22 uh, what we call R22 boils if you were to turn a, 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 a tank of it upside down and let the fluid out of the tank the R22 would hit the ground and immediately go to frost it comes out of the tank and boils in atmospheric pressure at minus 41.4 degrees. 41.4 below freezing Fahrenheit. R410A boils at 61, 62 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. So this is, this is a chemical. If we keep it under pressure, 
like anything, we can raise its temperature. If we reduce the pressure, we're going to reduce the temperature. So when you take the pressure off here, when you go from a small pipe under high pressure to larger pipes with a lower pressure, you're going to make a cold coil. So this is called the cold coil, this is called the hot coil. Now, what we're going to blow over here is, this is also called a line set, because this is the suction line, they call it, because the compressor sucks the, the gases back off of this coil, the cold gases. Now, we're going to take a fan of some sort and blow air over this coil, because this is a cold coil, and we're going to take that air, put it in a duct system, and, can, and send it off to the house. Now, the air that's coming over this cold coil is room temperature air. So if you've been into the beach all day, you get home, the house is 90 degrees, and you start your air conditioning system up, this compressor comes on, starts compressing gases,